Hello, I'm Amara Jones, host of The Last Sip here on FSTV, and I'm here at Netroots to have a series of conversations with important thought leaders, political leaders, uh, activists, um, and I'm really happy today to be joined by the Democratic nominee for New Mexico's first congressional district, Deb Holland, who I actually had on The Last Sip, and at that time was not the official Democratic nominee, so here you are. I am the live official e Democratic nominee. The first time we've seen each other live and in the yes. flesh. It's a good thing. It's wonderful to see you in Person. It's great to see you. So, um, first off, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and how does it feel? We'll get into the politics and all the rest of it, but as a person. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I've worked on a lot of campaigns as a volunteer, as a staffer, as, you know, whatever. As a candidate, I ran for lieutenant governor in 2014. And it's always wonderful to win, <laughs> right? I mean, winning feels better. <laughs> winning is better than losing. And, um, but we won by a lot. We, we won with close to 41% of the vote in a six-way race, and so uh, we're very proud of that fact. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the, the questions is how you stitched together such a large victory. Like, right. How did that happen? Well, from the very beginning, I said I wanted to run an inclusive campaign. So. We invited everybody, right? Uh, men, women, uh, we had a huge following from the LGBTQ community. I got some wonderful endorsements from the largest LGBTQ organization in the state, Equality New Mexico. I got the Planned Parenthood endorsement, uh, teachers unions. So we had union folks, we had women, we had a lot of millennials. Yeah. Of Congressional which, Black Caucus. Yes, the Congressional Black Caucus endorsed me. Uh, I had 13 members of Congress who endorsed my campaign. We just worked really hard to bring as many people as we possibly could into our campaign. And um, that worked because by the time uh, a poll came out before, right before the election that showed me three points behind the front runner, we said we can win this on the doors. So by that time, we called all those folks, we got them into the office, we sent them out knocking on doors and making phone calls, and essentially our field program really won the day. And I'm wondering if that is the one of the things to learn from your campaign that you think other Democrats can learn from. Um, I am, right, right, yes. I'm an organizer, that's what I've done for the last 20 years, getting out the Indian vote in my state, and I wholeheartedly believe in a very strong field program. Uh, to me, it's nothing beats talking to voters face to face. So I will always, I will always care about my field program, and we're gonna care about it this time around as well. And so, yes, I, I mean, I think we, we, we can win elections on the doors. Now, did you have, there's always this debate about the role of consultants and campaigns, and that Washington consultants like um, big ad buys, like the big razzle-dazzle of campaigns, because that's where they get their money as people, but that uh, what suffers is on, sort of on the doorstep organizing, because there's not just not as much money in it exactly. for consultants. Exactly. So I'm wondering, did you ever feel that pressure from the party to like, integrate, you know, you know, Deb, use this person and let them come advise you. And You know, we did have some consultants. We had a pollster, we had a media consultant, we had a male consultant. Um, and we did have some TV. However, we could not, there was so much money coming in from the outside for, for two of the other candidates. Um, super PACs that came in. We were essentially outspent three to one. Whoa and we could not compete with their TV buys at all. So at some point you just say, we're not competing on the TV, <laughs> right? Because right. it'd be a futile um, practice. So we, pay, we stick, stuck to our budget. We had a certain budget that we were going to use for TV. Uh, we stuck to our budget and the rest of the money uh, went for literature that folks were using to knock on the doors and uh, you know buying food for our volunteers. Wow, lots of pizza. Lots of pizza, lots of tacos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more tacos. <laughs> yes. Um, so 
One of the things that you mentioned to me when you were uh, in the a primary candidate is that w the first thing that you would do in Washington is to work on renewable energy Absolutely. for your district. And I'm wondering if, as uh, the, the nominee, whether or not that still holds. It absolutely holds. Yes, that's something everyone cares about in New Mexico. And if you came to visit us in New Mexico, 99.9% uh, .9 of your trip would be sunny, right? We have, <laughs> we have uh, almost 300 days of sun per year in New Mexico. There's no reason that we shouldn't be using that, those natural resources to power, our dis power my district, our state, and uh, create jobs for people who need them. Now that would collide with an administration obsessed with coal. <laughs> Well, it, yes, I think that my platform collides with 99.9% .9 of the uh, President Trump administration, absolutely, because I care, about, uh, I care about renewable energy, I care about jobs, I care about our environment. I don't want the uh, Endangered Species Act to be, uh, you know, sidelined so that um, oil companies can come in and drill. On the ground, after having just finished um, the a part of your race, um, I'm, what is it? What is the feel on the ground amongst the people who hopefully will be your constituents or might be your constituents in terms of um, where they are in this political moment? Are people still? Are they hopeful? Are they tired? Are they cynical? Um, wh what would you describe? They are excited. Oh, yes, wow. my, the people in my district are extremely excited. New Mexico One is a very progressive district. Uh, people have come out, um, you know, we had a big rally about the uh, family separation issue in Albuquerque. We did that when everyone across the country was having rallies of that nature. Uh, people are fired up and they're ready to go, quite frankly. So we're going to uh, make sure that we um, include all those people in our campaign. Uh, I want to make sure we get Democrats elected from the top of the ticket to the bottom. Right, down to sheriff. And that's yes, and we have a lot of women running in New Mexico also. There's, uh, on our court, state court of appeals, we have five women running to wow. fill five seats. Wow. Yes. So on the issue, uh, you just referenced immigration. Immigration has come up in um, your race against your opponent, um, and it's come up as a pretty much a divisive issue. And so I'm wondering um, what your perspective on that is. Like, why would a person running in a progressive district that had a large rally to end family separation stake their claim on immigration? Well, my opponent um, actually uh, is, was stated at a recent forum saying that she believes Trump's policies are succeeding. So uh, I think we are pretty much, you know, disagreeing on, on many of the policies that we, you know, that we believe in. So uh, I'm actually, um, I'm not necessarily worried, although uh, we will never take anything for granted. Um, as I said, it's a progressive district. People care about women's reproductive rights. They care about racist immigration policies. They care about uh, the direction our, our, our country is going. And, and uh, with respect to policies, uh, the Trump tariffs are actually hurting farmers in our state. And so, I mean, I have to listen to those things. I have to care about about my state and how and what people are saying on the ground. So. And are farmers complaining about that? Uh, I think uh, they haven't complained yet because I think it's like a, an article, a report just came out that that uh. like just yesterday. So uh, I imagine there'll be some chatter about it. How many more debates do you have with your opponent? Scheduled. We I think we have two or three scheduled right now. So uh, that's a, a couple lot. on television and one at um, uh, that the Jewish community puts on every year. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you are poised to be the first Native woman in the entire history of the United States to seat in the Congress, mm -hmm. which every time I think about and every time I tell someone the fact that that hasn't happened, everyone's blown away. Yes. Um, and it just shows the 
how much more work we have to do. Of course, that's a massive understatement. <laughs> um, but one of the things I'm wondering is how your cultural perspective um, as a native person informs your view on immigration um, and the relationship between like xenophobia um, and, um, and hostility amongst native people and how that contrasts with native culture. Right, right. So I have made um, this, the similarity between my grandmother being taken away from her family when she was eight years old and sent to Indian boarding school uh, for five solid years. She was not able to come home and her dad was only able to visit her twice in those five years because the only way for him to get from Laguna Pueblo to Santa Fe was with a horse and wagon. Um, she, um, I mean, it, it was, I'm sure it was devastating. Uh, when I've spoken to her about it in the past, uh, she, you know, she was already, you know, 70, 80 years old. She, she didn't really, uh, like, she didn't hold any hostility after the, that many years, but I imagine it was very difficult for her. Uh, but I make that similarity to how they're separating families on the border now, right? Uh, it's, it's family separation keeps rearing its ugly head in our society and at some point it has to stop. But it's, a re it's just a repeat of history right now and the governmental policies that feel you can have more control over people when you separate them. And the, 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 the um, mission for the government back then was to assimilate Indians into mainstream society and of course now it's to uh, dissuade people from coming to our country. Right, and I think that that's one of the key important um, things to note about the moment that we're in, that if you understand American history, that there are very few things that are taking place now which in the context of our history we haven't seen before, right? So, so many times, um, in so many ways, this is a repeat of certain aspects that we haven't completely dealt with. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, when I think about this, this whole family separation thing in Indian boarding schools, I think about uh, President Trump with the portrait of Andrew Jackson behind the Navajo Code Talkers um, on that day, and it, it, it's, 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 it's on purpose, right? Right, that's right. There's nothing accidental about that. That's right. Well, your candidacy is on purpose. Absolutely. <laughs> and yes. so far is, is doing well and winning, and we continue to wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Um, in the cu couple of months ahead. Good luck on those three um, debates. They'll be quite interesting, I'm sure. I think so, yes. I think we'll be able to show a stark uh, difference between me and my opponent. So, um, well, that's what campaigns are about, stark exactly. choices. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, all the best for your speech Thank later today you. at Netroots. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned on FSTV, Free Speech Television, for more great, amazing interviews with insightful people like Democratic nominee Deb Holland, New Mexico's first district.